Hi everybody, welcome again to another episode of this series that is meant to bring you on the streets of Paris in real time or on replay, no matter how you want to do it. Uh, of course, I've been doing some home editions because of the whole global, global pandemic thing. And so this is an episode, part two actually, dedicated to the Opéra Garnier, the Palais Garnier in Paris, the 9th arrondissement. Uh, it's a building that I, a lot of you know and love. And hopefully if you haven't been able to visit this magnificent monument, then one day uh, it'll be at the top of your list because you will not regret it. Uh, part one, I'll put a link to in the description in case you're coming here a little bit late to the party. And so you could get, right now you could go and click on that. In fact, if you're watching the replay and just watch part one. So uh, we're going to use some photos, obviously some images that I've collated from various corners of the internet. But also we're going to be using the Google Arts and Culture platform, which is a wonderful thing that they created for many monuments around the world, museums and, and things like that. And you can click virtually in 360 degrees as if we were there. So I'm sort of giving you a tour as if I were in the Opera House, pretending that you were in the Opera House with me. There are like there's a couple degrees of separation there. Thank you, David Dubois, for sending a super chat. And that is a perfect reminder for me to just quickly mention um, how you can support this project and help me to keep it going. There are several ways here. If you're watching live, of course, the super chat is a, a, an option. David Dubois, thank you very much. He says, uh, getting our French freak on. And so that will be going on live here, but also I have a new merchandise store of French Fry in Paris merchandise that I'm very excited about. So you'll find a link to that in the description. Please go check that out. It's another great way to support me. There is my PayPal address in the description as well. And you know what to do with that, but also, um, you can just uh, you can become a Patreon member. So there are all sorts of things. So thank you so much. And I see Heather Jackson is there in the comments. She says, for Corey freaking fry. There's a freaking theme. People are using the word freaking today and I don't know why, but I'm, I'm going with it. So I will say merci freaking beaucoup to Heather Jackson there in the super chats. Um, okay, well, let's jump right into it here. What I'm going to do is um, get rid of my selfie cam because we don't really need that anymore. That is going to be like that. Okay, excellent. And so here we are just alone with the Opéra Garnier. To get you up to speed a little bit and just to remind you, I actually want to bring um, up this gentleman here. This is our architect. This is the star of the show in many respects. And that's uh, Charles Garnier. And he was this uh, ragtag unknown uh, scruffy, as you can see. He looked kind of scruffy to me compared to the, um, the very well-kept Gent, uh, gentlemen, well-kempt people the, of, of the 19th century, the men at least. And so he wins this anonymous um, contest to be the architect of the Grand Opera House for Emperor Napoleon III. And I want you to consider, we're going to go back to the fact that he wasn't really known at all, in fact, wasn't prepared to win this contest. And I came across these beautiful images. Let me use the arrows here. This is in fact the rather makeshift agency, the architectural offices that uh, Garnier had to set up. And he, again, recruited a bunch of his friends um, and scrambled to, to get together sort of um, a, a dream team to actually build this thing that he had imagined and he had drawn out on paper. So this was uh, very close to the construction site itself in the 9th arrondissement. And then this next, next image I found is the interiors of one of those offices. And it's just dynamite. If we look at some of the details here, uh, for example, this is Garnier right here. And you can see he's, he's real excited for this photograph. Now, when you took photos back then, you definitely knew it. There weren't a lot of snapshots that would catch people off guard. You know, the camera would have to be set up. It was this whole long affair and the shutter speed was slow. So he definitely knew he was being photographed, but here he's, he just looks like he can't be bothered. But you know what? I'd be that exhausted as well if I were him trying to work on this project and trying to, to manage everything. And um, this is also beautiful here to the left-hand side. You can see the the drawing of the, what the building would be, and then here on the right-hand side, the floor plan. Thank you, Debbie Kwasinski. I see you there in the comments. I really appreciate that. Um, she says, merci freaking beaucoup to you, Corey. And then what I also love is what they put above the doors here in the office. Uh, just I, I just love that. I don't know if these were castings of future decorations for the Opera House and they were using them to make decisions or to study, or if they were owned by Garnier or another architect and just placed here for decoration and inspiration in general. But that's gorgeous. If I had, if I had those relics kicking around, those art objects, objects, I'd definitely hang them above a doorway as well. And then here right here, this is, it took me a, a moment to notice this, but these are all their top hats piled up. I think that's fantastic. I assume they would all be labeled on the inside, or do you think these guys would sometimes mix up their top hats? 
Anyway, so this was the, um, these were the makeshift uh, design offices and architectural agency offices that Garnier had to create really out of thin air because it wasn't an established architect. And then this right here is what would become the Boulevard de l'Opéra. And we're going to see that later on because one of the Google Arts and Culture um, options that we can explore in a virtual reality sense is the rooftop, in fact, of the, the Opera House. And there are definitely some stories to tell on the rooftop. We're going to go down in the, uh, to the lake in the basement and talk about the Phantom of the Opera, but we're also going to go all the way up to the rooftop today. So if you can see here, if you can make it out, there's the, the faded image of the Opera House that was constructed. But then right here in front of us, they had to create the boulevard, which did not exist the Boulevard de l'Opéra, and you can see right here these buildings that would eventually be destroyed, relocated, and it just reminds you of just what an immense project this was. We're going to talk more about this boulevard again as uh, we proceed and when we get up onto the rooftop. <clears throat> Check in with everybody here live. Thank you, Peggy Baker. She says, super frickin' free Saturday morning fun. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Appreciate that. And thank you to John Hederman. He says, from Rose and John, here is some freak. Here is some cash. Um, thank you so much, John. It's great to hear from you and Rose, actually. Got fond memories of us, us uh, touring together. So moving on to the building itself, we got this beautiful image of the entrance here on the lower right, or what would be the, the main entrance of the opera. You no longer access this building via that front entrance or those stairs. In fact, all visitors come around here on the, the western edge and they use this very spectacular entrance, which was, which was originally designed for Napoleon III, emperor at the time. And this grand entrance actually reminds us of the fact that the whole story behind the, the Opéra Garnier is really a story of an assassination. Because in the previous opera house that existed in the 19th century, just a little bit east uh, in the 9th arrondissement of where this one is today, um, there was an assassination attempt. So the Emperor Napoleon and his Empress, Empress were getting out of a carriage in front of the former opera house and Italian assassins threw three bombs into the crowd to try to take out the empirical family. Um, the Emperor and Empress uh, got out of it unscathed, but there were eight dead in the crowd and 142 injured, if you can believe it. So it was actually, um, it was big news at the time and it was quite a tragedy and it really spooked the Emperor. And so when, it, when eventually that opera house um, it burned down and it was time for a new one to be built. Napoleon demanded that Mr. Garnier, the architect, give him a very grand but also private entrance, which is what you see right here on the left. And in fact, these two ramps that you see um, were elevated. So the idea was Napoleon could arrive to the opera house in his carriage and not even leave the coach. And the horses would pull him and his party right up inside the building before they would get out of the coach. And so that's an interesting testament to how paramount security was when you were visiting the opera as a high profile uh, character. And uh, interestingly, Napoleon would never be able to use this. He would fall from power before he even got to use this entrance or got to, to use his grand opera house. So that's a little bit of irony there. The whole Franco-Prussian war and everything saw a removal of Napoleon from power. But this used to lead to, the, the idea was it would lead Napoleon to um, apartments, furnished apartments and private rooms and a library and he would have this whole, a whole sort of mini, sort of a mini palace within the palace. And of course that's, you know, life was good if you were an emperor. Someone sent me something in the comments. Oh, thank you, Fred Smizer. Can see you there. Appreciate that for the, appreciate the support. Now when Garnier was asked by or demanded by Napoleon to install this entrance, which was not part of the original concept, it actually very much perturbed Garnier because if you look at this building, it's all about symmetry and balance and order. And that's what Garnier was very much going for. And if you look, there's here, there's a beautiful little pavilion and then a pavilion here, which would have created almost a sort of a crucifix form like the old churches of, of back in the day. But the fact that this had to be added on um, didn't please Garnier at all because it really threw off the balance. But you're able to to use part of this entrance as um, just an ordinary visitor because this is where the public access happens. And then when you enter via the sort of general uh, self-guided tour of the building, which I highly recommend, we are going to, you're going to come across this. And so now we're going to move into to our Google Arts and Culture platform. So this is what you do. You enter here and you're going to come into what we call the the pavillon des abonnés, abonnés meaning the subscribers or the season ticket holders. So there would have been another, remember that pavilion on the far side that didn't have the fancy entrance that was for the season ticket holders. And they would have come in through this side from the eastern side of the building. 
and they would have been essentially the first part of the opera that they would experience and enjoy would be this, the Pavillon des Abonnés. And you can see the floors just absolutely spectacular, all hand-laid mosaics and the colored marble. And it just goes around and around in the, um, I mean, the, the light fixtures here. What? Come on. Sorry, I'm getting a little zoom happy. So this is today where you enter here, you go buy your tickets. Same if you're gonna actually watch an opera. Come in, buy your tickets over here at the billetterie. This, I mentioned in the previous uh, part one of this, if you remember that one of my favorite movies, Interview with a Vampire, uh, filmed here. And if you look closely in the Paris section of that movie, when Brad Pitt and Kirsten Dunst first arrive to Paris, they use this as a, um, it doubled as a hotel lobby. So they put like some desks here and a bunch of patrons walking around. And you can see those two characters, Brad Pitt and company, walking through, he through here as if it were the uh, lobby of their hotel. And then also here, we're gonna zoom in. In fact, maybe I'll take us over around here. I've got so many fun details to show you today. I'm so excited, so excited. I gotta remember to even take a, a deep breath from time to time because I get so worked up. It's so, it's so fun. So there's a beautiful design here. Of course, you've got these faces sculpted around. But if you look closely, in fact, what's going on here is there, there's lettering here. There's actually a message. And this is the mid 19th century. And architects simply at that time didn't sign their buildings. They didn't put their name on the buildings. But Garnier at the time wanted to do it. But he had to do it in a discreet kind of way. So if you look closely, this very ornate floral pattern actually spells out starting right here with the letter J. He writes his full name, which, which is Jean Louis Charles Garnier. And then it says architect, <laughs> architect right here. That's the, an upside down A R T architect. And then it has the dates of the construction right here. Can you make it out? It's 1861. So here's an eight, six, one to 1875. You can see the eight there. Hopefully you can make at least that part out on your screens. So his entire name and then architect and then 1861 to 1875. And it's just uh, pretty spectacular and very well hidden. You get, really gotta be looking for it. So that is one, one of the, the earliest uh, instances of an architect signing his, his building. Ah, Heather Jackson mentions, FYI, Interview with a Vampire is on Hulu right now. So anybody who's on Hulu, definitely check that out. It's just really beautiful, very interesting story. And you'll get to see some, some Paris and certainly some of this opera house. Now here's, this is something fun. I don't know exactly where it is, but there was once a sort of a secret doorway with, that would lead from this room, the Pavillon des Abonnés, to an underground, a secret underground passage. And it would lead you several feet, a subterranean secret tunnel that would go across the street to another very special building. And that building that you could be led to for is particularly the audience members would be this. This is the famous headquarters, former headquarters of the French bank Société, Société Générale, excuse me. And it's an absolutely exquisite building in existence at the same time as the Opera House and right across the street. But why would audi audience members want to use that subterranean secret tunnel to go and access the bank? It's because all of the women that would come visit the Opera House, they would want to wear their most lavish and expensive and beautiful jewelry, but it was way too dangerous for them to keep it at their homes and put it on and travel to the Opera House with their pearls and their jewelry and then be in the show and then go home with their jewelry. So they would keep it here in the bank in the Société Générale and they were allowed access, or perhaps more often their servants were allowed access from that pavilion that we were just inside, underground, several feet, uh, a block away. And they would make their way not only to this bank, which you can still pop in and look at this. Don't take photos, they don't appreciate it. I'm actually, I was very fortunate to snag this photo one day. It's one of my prized possessions because normally they shut you down if you pull out a camera. But you can still pop in and even though you can't take photos, you can absolutely, from here, Look at this beautiful iron and glasswork. But look what's downstairs, which you can also see today as well. This big, beautiful vault. And still today, behind those bars are a series of uh, safety deposit boxes that Parisians are still using today. And God only knows what's locked up 
in this beautiful vault as far as, you know, priceless artwork and artifacts and beautiful objects from hundreds of years ago, I'm sure. And so this is where the, the, the jewelry would be kept uh, by the, the women who were visiting the opera, and they would only access it via that subterranean passage uh, for the show, and then immediately they would come back or their servants would run through the, the tunnel and go and deposit the jewelry back in the vault, and so it would remain safe at all times. I think that's just fantastic. I can see a lot of wows in my live audience here. Everybody is saying wow. Heather's saying sneaky sneaky. So that tunnel, I understand, has since been um, blocked up. So there's no longer, obviously, they didn't want people to continue to have access to the bank. But just spectacular. Look at that. Oh, it's so good. And this is just right next door to the, um, to the Opera House. You can still find it today. Look at the flooring. That's all mosaic as well. Oof. Ooh, doggy. And back to the... Actually, let's go there. So I'll be ready for the next one. And here we go. Back to our pavilion. Pavillon des Avonites. And so again, today, this is how you or I access the Opera House. And then you come through here. Remember last week, we talked about the Grand Escalier. Well, this is under it. We're under it right now. So right here is the grand staircase that I featured last time. And then, of course, this is you exit, uh, access it rather via these two. And I'm actually going to see if this will allow me to back up just a smidge. Not too much, just the minimum. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> I'm breathless. I'm speechless. Look at this. So remember, this was... You might ask yourselves, well, why was the, the undercarriage of the staircase so fancy? It's simply because this is where all of those season ticket holders that were paying top dollar to have a box seat, for example, in the auditorium, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This is how they would access the grand staircase, not necessarily from the front door. So you really had to impress the folks, the patrons, who were the season ticket holders here. Oh my goodness. And then as we get a little bit closer, let me step off to the side if I can. This is really nice here. This was originally a fountain. It was called the La Fontaine de la Piti, and Piti is the French name of a Greek mythological character. Let me zoom in a little bit. She's the statue there. Oh, Corey. This is good enough. Uh, Pythia, we would call her. Pythia was in Greek mythology, the high priestess, an oracle who transmitted messages from Apollo, the god of music and other things. And so um, interesting story behind this statue. It's signed with a masculine name, Marcello or Marcello. Again, I just want to give you a little bit of a better view. So it has a masculine name signed somewhere here on the bottom, but in fact was not sculpted by a man. It was sculpted by a woman who was a duchess, in fact, and um, her name was Adèle Daffry, and she had her studio in this sculpture here, and Garnier, the architect, saw it in her studio, and he said, I must have this for my, for my opera house. And, you know, with the norms of the time and the, the way the, the culture was in the mid-19th century, a woman sculptor could have been frowned upon or in many cases wouldn't have even been accepted or she wouldn't have been allowed to show her work in a grand building like this. So she had a uh, a pseudonym, and so it's signed Marcello or Marcello. So just a little fun fact there, the, the statue. Thank you, John. I can see you there. And he's asking, how is Paris doing during the day? I haven't spent too much time in Paris. I've been really busting my buns at home for these episodes and for some other projects, John. So um, I couldn't quite tell you. Um, you'll have to check in with some other folks to see exactly what Paris looks like right now. But um, never fear. Soon I will be uh, doing some live tours from the streets and from my bike and whatnot. We will definitely get back into the, the swing of that. Hey, Lisa Freakin' Chorney, I can see you there. Thank you so much in the comments. She says, merci for translating the ceiling. I was trying to decipher it myself and I couldn't do it. Um, of course, if I do miss your, your comment or your super chat, please forgive me. It's just because I get so excited looking at my screen here, like all of you. And of course, these are costumes that were added. Uh, 
recently. This right here, as I mentioned, this little basin used to be filled with water and there used to be, as I understand it, jets of water individually that were shooting up here on the front side to create a beautiful wall of fountain water in front of the statue of Pythia here. There were lily pads and everything. Oh man, just look at this. I mean, I just can never get enough of it. Oh. Wow. Okay. I mean, I want to dwell, but we can't dwell forever, can we? Thank you everybody for joining, by the way. And um, next, we're going to just, we don't have to go far. We're just going to go right down here to the lower left and we're going to take ourselves, whoop, transport ourselves to the auditorium itself. Now, and the stage. This is such a, a testament to how amazing this building is because this is part two of the series and I'm what, like 25 minutes into part two and we're just now getting to the actual place where the shows happen. Isn't that a testament to how beautiful and vast and exquisite the rest of the building is? That... 25 minutes into part two, we're finally getting to the actual auditorium. And this is just so, my goodness. There are around 2,000 seats here. And it was very common in this era in the mid-19th century for the theaters to have blue seats or green seats. But Gagne chose uh, red velvet here. And one of the reasons he did, I find very, very interesting and very ingenious, is that he, if you sit down in a red velvet chair and you're essentially surrounded as an audience member by red velvet, it's all going to reflect. It's going to ref reflect red and pink light onto you. And so these women in particular that wanted a, a, a youthful, beautiful appearance, this red velvet would bounce around the, the reddish light and it would make them, their arms, exposed arms and their faces, look very youthful and pink and vibrant and young. So that was one reason he wanted red velvet everywhere. And I think that's brilliant. That's beautiful. In fact, if I ever attend a show here for real, which I have not yet done, and I should one day, that would be really a nice treat to, uh, for myself. I would like to see if that red light still reflects against your skin and how it alters your complexion. So here you've got the normal seats, of course, and then several box seats all around the upper levels. And here, if we zoom in, there are two um, very ornate, beautiful box seats here, and you can see they're fancier than the others. And they would have been for Napoleon, Emperor Napoleon III, had he actually lasted long enough to enjoy this place. And there's another one here. But certainly, plenty of dignitaries and celebrities and VIPs would have used this in particular. However, you got to imagine the view was not great. I mean, you'd be looking down on some of the dancers, but decidedly very much from the side. Over here on this side, speaking of box seats, this is box seat number five. And that is famously the box seat of the Phantom of the Opera. If you didn't already know, uh, the Phantom of the Opera story originated in this opera house. And we're going to certainly talk about that later on. We're going to descend into the bowels of this building, an area called the lake. There is technically a lake. In fact, deep beneath, about five or six stories beneath the stage where we are standing virtually. Virtually standing in our minds right now. Now, speaking of these box seats, uh, several of them... It's not just to sit and view the opera, but they have rooms attached, all covered in red velvet, with corridors and sofas and place to hang your hat and your coat and all these private, sort, I guess sort of like box seats in stadiums nowadays have. But what's interesting is you didn't, at the time, you know, we think of the, the, the opera goers as a very sophisticated crowd, but the truth is a lot of them came to the opera just to hang out. They didn't necessarily care about the show. They would show up fashionably late. They would get distracted. Uh, you might, they might as well have just turned on the TV and they would pop in and out and grab a drink and have a smoke and see what was going on out in the staircases and go grab an ice cream and while the show was going on. And sometimes they wouldn't even pay attention to, to the stage all that much. And they, some of them, the season ticket holders in these box seats would show up so late that they would miss half of the opera. And it got so, so bad to the point that they started to demand that the opera place the ballet portion of the opera because many operas would have a specific ballet section as part of the structure. And that was usually one of the most entertaining and beautiful and lyrical parts uh, of an opera. And it was really one of the crowd favorites. But the, the season ticket holders would show up so late that they demanded that the opera house switched the structure and put the ballet in the third act of the opera instead so they could actually watch it. So, and apparently the opera house did that in many instances to appease, again, their, they knew which, uh, which side of their bread was buttered. Um, and it was certainly 
to appease the ticket holders. So yeah, they would actually restructure the operas to put the ballet later on because people didn't show up early enough to catch it. If you're just joining me live, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Here we are doing part two of the Palais Garnier, the famous opera house. And this is just another view that I just will never, will never get old. Let's, hold on, let me get a little bigger there. Um, let me, can I do this? No, let me close all these because we don't need to be staring at all that. All right, so next is the chandelier, which we can see beautifully from here. We'll talk about the ceiling in a moment because that's got its own story for sure. This is eight tons of bronze and crystal designed by Garnier himself. Sorry, that's way too zoomy. Um, Cause you know, Garnier really had a hand in almost every single detail, which makes him an even, even more impressive architect. It was originally gas lit. If you can imagine all of this was gas, must've been quite, quite a thing to behold. Um, it would stay lit up all during the performance. Remember I mentioned that people get distracted. They didn't necessarily sit and, you know, there wasn't the, the quiet reverence of the opera as an art form back then as we think of it now. So this would remain lit the whole time. So this whole room was lit up, maybe not quite this much as we see today, but that was because, you know, people want to move around. They want to see and be seen. You know, if you've got a beautiful dress and a gown and whatnot, you certainly want people to see it even during the show. So this would have all been illuminated to some extent because that chandelier, basically they never turned it off. Um, today, of course, it's not gas lighting. There are 340 light bulbs just in the chandelier here, keeping everything illuminated. Now the circular panel that you see up here was not just random, it was not just aesthetic. It was designed actually very ingenious. It was designed so that if you had to clean the chandelier or maintain it or fix it, this whole thing would lift up into a shaft above where the workers could access it. So this whole panel here you see that it, it really there's no, it's not random the fact that it's exactly the size of, of the chandelier itself. And so it would lift up. In fact, I can take us over to here because the next image I want to show you is a beautiful cross section. Some of you might recognize this from the Musée d'Orsay because it is still there to my knowledge. If you visit the, the Orsay Museum, you will find this beautiful handmade cross section of the opera house. So I want to point your attention. Of course, we're here and the chandelier is right here at the top of the auditorium. And look at this. It was designed by Garnier originally so that chandelier could just go and it would be lifted up via pulleys and it would be dangling right here and then the workers could access it. Ingenious, isn't it? Nowadays, that's not the case. Eventually, the directors of the museum decided to uh, make it so that the chandelier could be lowered to the floor. And that obviously is safer and it's probably much easier to, to work on the thing. But this space still exists here. And in fact, what's, what's up here now, actually, I don't know that this exists. I think they removed it because there are rehearsal rooms. In fact, I know that there are rehearsal rooms up above now because um, they don't use this, they don't access But by, by the way, while we're here in this cross-section, this is a great way to realize just how much of the space is dedicated to not the performance. So obviously this is where everybody is in the auditorium and this is the stage with an impressive structure of all of this just to move, you know, curtains and, and set pieces. And then down here, we've got another five or six floors of all stage mechanisms. And then of course down here is where the lake is. And we're gonna get into the Phantom of the Opera story, I promise you that, a little bit later on. Uh, something happened here in the comments. Thank you, Daniel Molden. Thanks for the support in the comments. She says, merci beaucoup for bringing me back to one of my favorite buildings in Paris. That is so true, it's absolutely one of mine too. It might even, you know, if you, if you twist my arm, it might be my all-time favorite building. And I can see you there, John, John Woods as well, thank you. He says, thanks for keeping it going, Corey. You got it, man. I appreciate all of you. So this space here is dedicated to the show itself. And then you've got a beautiful rehearsal space here, which we'll talk about. You can see that's pretty fancy in its own right. And I'm gonna show you that in a moment. There's a whole story behind that. But then this is the grand staircase cl closer to the entrance that we featured last time. And then this is the grand foyer, which was that gilded Versailles style corridor. And then this is the, what used to be the main entrance, the front, front facade. So you have at least, if you add up this and this, at least as much space just for walking around and smoking a cigar and hobnobbing, just as much space to do that as there was for the actual performance. Let's get back to this because I want to talk about the ceiling. Oh, before I get there though, 
Speaking of the Phantom of the Opera, one of the mysterious events that prompted the rumors that would eventually become the, the, uh, the story Phantom of the Opera, the chandelier in the Phantom of the Opera, if you know the story, falls. Uh, but the, in, in real life, the chandelier didn't fall, but a counterweight did. So you can imagine this is eight tons. And up above what we can't see in the ceiling are a bunch of counterweights on pulleys that are basically with their own weight helping to keep the chandelier up. Without those counterweights, this would just be too heavy. It would almost be impossible to keep it from, from falling. One of those counterweights up in the ceiling during a performance fell through the ceiling and killed a woman. And they say, according to the story, that she was sitting in seat number 13. And that happened in real life. So, of course, you know, unlucky number 13 and kills her in the chandelier. That, that was included in, and exaggerated for the Phantom of the Opera novel. And, of course, if you see the, the famous uh, production, the Broadway production of Phantom of the Opera, of course, it starts with the chandelier. I did see that myself, and I certainly remember that beautiful chandel chandelier um, opening of the original Phantom of the Opera show. That was 1896 when the, the counterweight fell through. So let me see here. Well, I want to get a little bit closer, perhaps, to show you the ceiling. Zoom out a little bit. Look at that. Oh, I don't know who decided. Well, it was obviously Garnier. But look at this decision here to do these triangles. And doesn't it give a, a sense of like a sun or a starburst? My goodness. So this, some of you who already love... Oh, that's way too far. I don't know why it zoomed so far. Some of you who love this building already know that this is not the original ceiling. But we'll talk about that in a moment. In 1964, they installed this rather modern uh, painting by Marc Chagall. Chagall was a Russian-born... Uh, artist who uh, uh, later on received French nationality as well. And he was known as a master of color, just a master, master colorist. And he was revered by all the artists at the time. What we see here are 14 different operas represented by big name composers. So that's what's going on here. And we've got composers represented such as Mozart and Beethoven and Debussy and Wagner and Tchaikovsky. Um, so a good dozen or 14 operas represented here. It took more than 400 pounds of paint just to paint this thing. Now, at the time, Chagall was 77 years old, and so he wasn't about to, to paint this whole thing on his own. So what he did was he uh, painted a smaller version, a scale model version, as a study, and then he hired another painter, a, a, a theater designer, or a theater decoration uh, designer, to paint the, the large-scale version in Chagall's studio. So Chagall was there next to this painter, and they were painting the large-scale version, and Chagall would say, point to it and say, no, I want a different color there, or a bit more yellow there, or blah, blah, blah. So um, 400 pounds of paint. No, it's not, it, it wasn't the original ceiling. And I can show you what the original was, for those of you who might be uh, wondering about that. So let me go back to my photos. Check this out. This is a small model version of what the original ceiling looked like above the chandelier. And of course, it makes complete sense because Garnier would have wanted something much more classical with this sort of Greco-Roman myth mythological uh, scene playing out, which we can find throughout this building. So this was the original. You can see the artist's name here. And one reason that the, the opera really didn't have a choice when it came to covering it up and replacing it with the Chagall, because it actually still exists uh, behind the Chagall. So this painting, this original ceiling is still there, but it was just covered up. Uh, the reason is, remember that enormous chandelier, that eight-ton chandelier, when it was gas lit, can you imagine all of the smoke and soot from that gas lighting that was just feet away from the original roof? It just destroyed it and just absolutely obliterated this beautiful painting. And um, they tried to restore it several times to save it, uh, and they couldn't. The restoration projects kept falling through, and it was just turned out to be too much of a task. So that's why in the 1960s, um, one of the opera directors decided to enlist Chagall and have him put the new version up. Um, now, it's up to you to decide whether you wish the auditorium still had its original ceiling, or if you like the Chagall, the Chagall modern flair. That's one people fall on either side of the fence very strongly. But what's fun is just researching this episode a few days ago, I came across, because I was Googling, of course, and I came across this. 
This is on change.org. Three years ago, some French person tried to start a petition. <laughs> it's closed now, so don't, think, don't feel like you can go and, and sign it now. But it says, let's give back to the Palais Garnier its original ceiling. And you can see the comparison here. Now, sadly, three years ago, this petition, you know, it's, it's cool that they tried, but if you look here, it only got 270 signatures. So it never got any traction at all. But what it says here in the text basically is, it says, if we know that, that Garnier the architect meticulously chose every single detail of his opera house, is it really right to have altered it? You know, should we honor the fact that he was, he, it was his vision and every single detail he had a hand in, in designing and organizing. So it's kind of interesting that there's a petition there. Let me check in with my live viewers here. Phyllis says, I love the Chagall. Yeah, let me know in the comments, folks. Let me know uh, how, if you're down with it. Christina Consolé says, I kind of like both, but I lean toward the original. And then she says, Dod dodging the tomatoes being thrown at my head. I mean, I, I, I imagine perhaps you want my official take on it. I don't mind it. I love the classical painting that, in fact, currently is hidden behind this. It's probably in really bad shape. The only reason I'm not super sad is I think these colors still work with the auditorium. And I also think that there's so much other, there's, this, there's so much other classical beauty in this building. Obviously with the grand staircase and the ceilings painted everywhere, you definitely got, you've got your fair share of the classicism. So why not? I mean, Marc Chagall, before you pass judgment on the ceiling, one quote from Picasso that always runs through my mind when I see the ceiling here. He once famously said, uh, Picasso, he said, um, he said, once um, Chagall dies, or once Matisse dies, rather, Chagall will be the only artist that truly understands color. So even in Picasso's eyes, Matisse and Chagall were really the guys who understood what color was and how to utilize it. So um, you can keep that in mind. If, if it's good enough for Picasso, who I'm a fan of, then maybe it's good enough for the rest of us. Let's turn around here. Larry says, this, the Chagall is so uplifting and light. He's a fan. Jennifer Robinson says, he actually didn't want to paint the ceiling and refused it originally. Uh, that's interesting, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, so let's give credit. Of, in fact, uh, keeping that in mind, let's give Chagall credit for being a little bit reticent and being like, eh, I don't know if I want to be the guy. And John Woods is mentioning, too, there are lots of Chagall windows at the Metz Cathedral. Great. Uh, so we're going to turn back toward the stage. And, of course, this is where the, um, the orchestra sets up. This is not a curtain. As you can see, it's painted. Beautiful panel painted with this um, sort of a trompe l'oeil uh, red velvet curtain with the tassels and the gold braiding and everything. It's spectacular. And then if we zoom in on the top here, this says the year... 1669, that was um, when Louis XIV here, the Sun King, you can see him right here. That's when Louis started the Academy of Music, which would later become the Opera of Paris, the Paris Opera. Um, and so that's why 1669 is written up there. Now, before we move on, the stage just is a, is a good opportunity to mention how successful this opera house is still today and how grand it still is compared to others in Europe. The annual budget for this place is 220 million euros a year to keep the production, you know, the building going and the production and everything that they do in here. Um, there are 1,800 employees, including 170 musicians and over 100 singers just to keep this production going throughout the year. 150 dancers, it's, it's just staggering. And what's really mind-blowing is that this, the attendance rate throughout the year um, is 97%. So they fill each year on average 97% of all of these seats. And that's really also a testament, I think, to how good the program is each year that the opera comes up with as far as the performances. Now, it should be noted that operas are very rarely performed here nowadays. That's been moved over to the more modern Opéra Bastille. So here we see a lot of smaller productions and ballets and things like that. 
Uh, this stage also is about 80 feet deep. And there are, of course, all those mechanisms that we talked about before. And if we get a little bit closer, if I click here, um, it actually opens. So they opened it to, to photograph this section. And you can see the actual wooden part of the stage here is very small. I like how you can see here the, the scratches of moving the set pieces around and stuff. I'm sure every one of those uh, grooves and scratches has its own story, right? And then look at the stage, it's vast. They can fit up to 450 artists on the stage for a performance. And so that allows you just to create the most grand, sumptuous uh, sets. Thank you, Nancy Brisson. I see you there in the comments. really appreciate the support. Excellent. Uh, let's make our way forward here. And then once you get here on the stage, and this is a thrill because actually none of these areas, including what we're about to see there, that beautiful gilded room, none of this is available to the general public. Even if you pay to go and walk around inside, uh, you have to have a very special guided tour to access the stage itself. And look at this. This is dizzying when you look up there. I mean, you're almost, it's like a skyscraper above you. And just all these separate dividers and curtains and scaffolding and, you know, the set pieces that can come in and out and up and down. And then, of course, don't, don't forget that there are platforms that raise up and down as well, about five stories below. And now, you may be asking yourselves, if you're not familiar with it already, what is going on back here? Just very discreetly tucked away. And this is as close as we can get. You see, I don't have any more arrows to click us through. But look at this. Just yet again, another reminder of how this building is absolutely exquisite because this is almost would appear to be an afterthought tucked away, way behind the stage, far away from anything publicly accessible. And you can see there's actually, it's a, it's a rehearsal space where the dancers would pre prepare for each show. And this is in fact a mirror where you can see back toward us and back to the auditorium that's at our backs. This is called the Foyer de la Danse. And it's one of the most hidden pieces of uh, places of beauty in the entire city. And this has a story behind it as well, of course. Um, the pre-show rehearsals would see the ballerinas and the dancers there all uh, in costume, preparing and rehearsing and getting ready and warming up right before the show. But what would happen was the um, season ticket holders that were particularly wealthy men, would there was this rather sort of seedy and odd um, habit of the men being allowed to come here and meet the dancers ahead of time, to watch them perform, to interact, or interact with them. And what would happen often was the dancers, the young girls, would be propositioned by these men. And I'm not going to get too much into it, but there was definitely a seedy, sordid side to the opera house that was completely accepted in the 19th century. And a, a lot, there were a lot of sort of sugar daddy setups and mistresses and, and things like that. And the men would come here and watch the women perform. Um, and the dancers themselves were sometimes feeling forced into these arrangements because you couldn't really support yourself as just a dancer or perhaps just as a singer for that matter. And so it was one of those situations where these very young girls would be um, unfortunately coerced or somehow feel pressured to find a man that could take care of them and help them live a lifestyle, uh, a certain lifestyle, but then also, you know, would be, um, there would be a relationship there. Now, what's very, very interesting about this idea is that we know Degas, who I love, painted the opera house in many different views and facets, and he adored this place and really, really painted almost half of his, of his uh, works were related to dancers, the opera house, of course, the famous ballerina paintings. And I know you know a lot of those, but what you may not have noticed before, and I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, but this is, you can do your own research. Some of his very famous, beautiful ballerina images, look at this. There is this man lurking, essentially in the shadows. And Degas was very aware of what was happening. And here's another one. Can you even see it right away? Because of course your eye is drawn to the dancers. Look at this. So if you're interested in learning more about the story, again, I'm not gonna dwell on it, dwell on it because it's a rather dark side of the opera and I don't wanna offend anybody by, by getting into it, into it too much. And I don't think that Degas was necessarily condoning this, but he was absolutely, he wanted to document the fact that there was this, these relationships being formed and the fact that these men were making their, making their rounds. And so, um, isn't this, I mean, I don't think I would have noticed this until I started to go into to the story. 
But and those two paintings are not the only ones, by the way. Um, I'll let you do your own Googling. And a surprising number of Degas' sketches and paintings of the opera house and the dancers have these sort of dark, shadowy figures um, lurking behind curtains and corners and whatnot. So it is what it is. Um, I want to just uh, shout out to Janet Wambolt, who sent me some love in the comments. She says, what a special, special treat this is. It's special for me as well, Janet. I appreciate having you all here. Jay Palmer says, thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Jay Palmer. And Cindy Grief uh, says, thanks, Corey, giving me some love and support in the comments. But anyway, this um, practice of the men going and watching the, the young girls rehearse was shut down in 1930. There was a new director of the Opera House, and he said, you know what, no more. We're going to close this off to, to the public. And so that... That practice um, ceased to happen in this building, at least, in 1930 and onward. And now, as I said, you cannot access this at all. Even, apparently, our 360-degree camera that's allowing us this view couldn't access it either. But uh, what a treat. That's called the Foyer de la Danse. Um, okay, so let's move on to the... Uh, the lake and the phantom of the opera. All we got to do is click back in our Google Arts and Culture and scroll down a little bit. And you can see here, we were just right there. Later, we're going to go to the roof. You can go into the bibliotheque, the library slash museum, which by the way, if you go to this museum, whether either virtually or in person, uh, you will see the original little mock-up of the classic uh, ceiling of the auditorium, that original ceiling. You can see a, like a scale model study of it. So if you want to see that in person, it's in these rooms here. But today, we're of course descending into Le Lac. Whew, look at this. Oh my goodness. So there's a, a ladder at that end and a ladder where we are right now. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. So now we are way in the bottom. We've descended into the absolute bowels of this opera house. And you got to know that, um, by the way, props to whoever took these photographs, because some guy had to take a 360 degree camera down here and either wade through this water or swim through it or something. Uh, so yeah, kudos to him. And we're going to, you can move your way through this. So spooky. And there are all these side canals that go off. And so let me tell you a little bit about this. Some of you who, who love the, the Opera House may have already heard a little bit of this. But when our, our star architect, Charles Garnier, won the contest for the building and started, of course, digging the foundations, that was step one, uh, he came across, a, uh, came across a very, very bad surprise. There was this um, ancient arm of the Seine River that was flowing beneath the 9th arrondissement that really nobody knew of. And he happened to be trying to build this building right on on that location. So he dug down, dug down, and all of a sudden it just burst in, all this water burst in and flooded the foundations. So we had to pump out the water, it flooded again. For a year and a half, Garnier and his crew tried to constantly pump the water out of the foundations while they were struggling to build the rest of the building on top of it. And eventually Garnier realized he wasn't gonna win against Mother Nature, and he gave up. And so he decided the only way to continue this project is to build a huge cistern a huge basin of water with this whole series of canals that would essentially just stay filled with water and, and balance out the water pressure of what would normally be flooding into the foundations. So that was the origin of this. And uh, it still exists, as you can see. And of course, as the opera house was being built, uh, rumors started to spread throughout Paris of a mysterious lake, quote unquote, beneath the opera house. And of course, people's imaginations ran wild. And around the same time, there were also these very uh, bizarre, mysterious, spooky occurrences in the opera house. And that's how the Phantom of the Opera story and the rumor itself started to spread. Excuse me. Um, let me um, pull up. Ah, this is, as I understand it, the original cover of the Phantom of the Opera novel. It started as a series of articles. I think it was a serial that was published in um, uh, some sort of magazine. But anyways, eventually, of course, by Gaston Leroux, you can see his name up there, the author. Uh, he published this in 1910, and it just spread like wildfire. It was a huge hit. People adored this story. And of course, it, it, what it managed to do was it actually confirmed the confirmed that the, the rumor was true because Gaston Leroux was in fact a journalist. He wasn't just a fictional writer. 
And that's why, for that reason and also the reason of how he started this novel, really convinced people that it was a journalistic, real nonfiction account of the truth, of the actual phantom. Thank you, Corinne. I can see there in the comments. She says, merci beaucoup for this fabulous tour and all your hard work to make it so. I appreciate that, uh, Corinne, because, um, yeah, it is quite a it's, a, it's a labor of love, but it is an awful lot of work to get this up and running each week. So there was the chandelier, the, the counterweight of the chandelier that fell and killed the person in seat number 13. There was also a performer of the opera that mysteriously fell from one of the balconies of the auditorium to her death. There was a stagehand found backstage who had been strangled but, um, or hung, but there was no rope or no weapon found. And so just too many mysterious um, occurrences. And then apparently there was a rumor that the, the directors of the opera at the time were sending huge sums of money to some anonymous, mysterious gentleman who requested that box seat number five be kept um, free and be kept uh, empty at all times for all performances. And so all of those things led up to this. And Gaston Leroux heard about this. He visited the opera, he talked to some people, and then he created his own uh, exaggerated account of the story. One reason, and we're going to move to this next image, one reason people were so, uh, were so convinced that this novel was true, that it wasn't fake, is here, I'm going to bring up, this is literally the very first words written in the novel. So you can see this is literally the title. We're start, this is the prologue. This is the beginning of the beginning. And he says, Leroux says, in which the author of this singular work informs the reader how he acquired the certainty that the opera ghost really existed. And then the very first text of the story says the opera ghost really existed, period. He was not, as was long believed, a creature of the imagination of the artists, the superstition of the managers, or a product of the absurd and impressionable brains of the young ladies of the ballet, their mothers, the box keepers, the cloakroom attendants, or the concierge. Yes, he existed in flesh and blood, although he assumed the complete appearance of a real phantom, that is to say, of a spectral shade. So that was enough for a lot of people to say, oh my goodness, this was actually based on a real guy. And as we continue the story, so this is the end of the corridor, right? But look, ah, the photographer continued through one of these little, look at this, and we enter this. It's a labyrinth. It's a complete maze on either side of this green murky water, series of canals and cisterns, and look at this. How freaky is that if you were down here alone in the middle of the night? Oh, thank you, Andrea, in the comments. Thanks for the love. She says, merci, Corey. Freaking unbelievably amazing tour this week. I'm blown away. Ah, oh, thank you, Andrea. I'm so glad that you're here. You're one of my favorite audience members, for sure. Always a lot of enthusiasm. Kathleen um, Schlier says, Corey, I appreciate the research behind your live tour so much. This episode is the bomb. Thank you so much. Um, let's continue... Can we continue? I'm pretty sure we can. Yeah. This is as far as we can go in, in this one direction, but look at this. So it keeps going that way. It keeps going all on all these sides. And this is where we came from, all the way down there. So there is, in fact, a real lake, and this inspired the Phantom of the Opera story. Um, now, there are theories still today people are trying to figure out, like, was the Phantom based on an actual person? And I've got two theories to throw out at you if, if you're interested. The first one is, um, some say that there was a musician, a Parisian musician, pianist, who would often in the mid-1800s practice and rehearse in the music conservatory um, on the Rue Pelletier in the 9th arrondissement before the opera house was built. And that uh, building burned down, and both he and one of the performers of the conservatory that he was in love with, they were in the building, it burned down, she died, the performer lost her life in the fire, and they say that this musician um, was horribly burned and disfigured. And he eventually hid and found refuge underneath the opera house and really was never to be seen again. So that was one theory, that it was this pianist who was burned in a fire. There's another theory as well of that Garnier himself, when he was building this building up above, hired a contractor by the name of Eric, Eric. And for those of you who remember the Phantom story, that is the actual name of the Phantom of the Opera. His name is Eric. And this theory says that Garnier hired the guy. He was a very good worker, but he happened to come from a very bizarre past. He was a circus performer and he had a deformed, disfigured face. And this guy, Eric, would wear a mask um, often to hide his uh, disfigured features. 
And then they say um, that he would have resided, he would have built himself a little home underneath the opera house and of course would eventually never be seen from again. He would fall in love with a performer and she would disappear for a few weeks and then be miraculously found. And so a lot of that stuff ties into what um, Leroux would use for his Phantom of the Opera story. Uh, there's also a legend, actually I mentioned I had um, two, but I have three for you. There's a legend that years later, workers here in the basement, in the, in the dark corners of the Opera Garnier, broke down a wall and they found, um, to their surprise, a completely furnished apartment that was hidden and it had been abandoned years before and it left completely untouched. So could it have been, in fact, um, the furnished apartment of one of these gentlemen that I just mentioned and, in fact, of the Phantom himself? Uh, there's even part of that legend, who knows if it's true or not, but that they found a corpse uh, in or near this apartment. And the corpse had this, it was a corpse of a disfigured um, skeleton. So, make of that what you will. But uh, I, uh, apparently you can visit some of these uh, parts of the Opera House if you get the right sort of guided tour. So look into that if you're really into it. Now, you may have heard too, but nowadays they use this lake. There are fish, there are carp, there are eels that were intentionally placed in this water to keep it circulating and to keep it, you know, from, from getting stagnant. And still today, the Paris Fire Brigade, uh, the firefighters, they have a, a team of divers that train and practice and run various exercises here in the, um, the lake as it's known. And in fact, Garnier's original intention, as I understand it, was not only to combat this bad surprise of the water running underneath the foundations, but also it was there to put out f uh, fires, which it still, as I understand, is being used for today. If they really need f uh, water in the Ninth Arrondissement, they can grab it from the lake here. Thank you, Kristen Parker. I can see the support there in the comments. She says, thank you for your thoughtful and thorough research, Corey. Your knowledge and storytelling keeps us going. I'm just thrilled that there are so many of you here who, um, who are as excited about these anecdotes as I am. So let's go from the very, very bottom to the very, very top for those of you who are still with me because all we gotta do is click here because not only did some poor SOB drag the camera down here into the lake, but he also made his way up to the roof. So let me zoom out a little bit. Here we are on the roof of the Opera Gagné. And you know, shout out to Google here, um, Google Arts and Culture, because they, they really, I promise you, this is not an advertisement for them, it's not sponsored by them. But how often would you be able to just sit in the comfort of your own home and enjoy the lake beneath the Opera House as well as the um, rooftop? So a few monuments that we can see here uh, as I zoom. The Tour Montparnasse, which I know y you all adore. <laughs> uh, we've got the Eiffel Tower, of course. We've got the La Madeleine. This right here is the Church of Saint Augustin. I did an episode, I don't remember the number of it. I did an episode inside this church all about that. So check out that, the Rue Saint Augustin, or the Église Saint Augustin. This is Printemps, department store. Uh, this is the Galerie Lafayette. I know many of you have visited the rooftop terrace of the Galerie Lafayette where you can see, uh, look back this way towards the building, the opera. This is the uh, Église de la Trini Tr Trinité, sorry, the Trinity, Holy Trinity. Of course, that's the Sacré-Cœur. And the burbs out in the distance and onward. So I've got some stuff to show you on the roof. We can move forward here. First of all, this here is the the peak, the apex of the opera house. And we've got Apollo, the god of music, the god of all sorts of things, holding up the golden lyre, of course. Huge Greco-Roman vibes that Garnier is going for. On either side of him, he's got harmony and poetry, a couple of allegories there. Tara back, Tara freaking back says, I would happily visit the rooftop. Um, so I just actually wanna zoom in here and look at this, graffiti. Now, unfortunately, I don't like graffiti as much when it's 1994, but somebody made their way up here, legally or otherwise, and I can tell you who it was. It was Julien and it was Sylvie. Perhaps we can assume that they are, well, let's assume they're young lovers. And so in January of 1994, they decided to immortalize their names. What we also have here is, um, let's see if I can back up a little bit, because there's some faded, faded graffiti as well. Come on, work with me. I wanna go one click this way. Oh, you can see the shadow. That almost looks, that could be my shadow. 
Did I take these photos? No, I'm way too afraid of heights. So anyway, maybe I can't show you the other bits of graffiti, but they're, they're, extremely, they're extremely light anyway. But I think they're older. Um, right here. Can you make that? I'm going to move the, move the cursor, but can you make that out? There's especially on the left-hand side. There's a little bit, there's some faded graffiti just right here. I wish I knew what that was. That's probably much older. And then right here, just above where my, right there, you can see there's something. Can't read it, but that's probably pretty old as well. Onward. So look at this, these little staircases that are all part of Garnier's design so people can access the stairs. Now, those of you who are lovers of Paris and current events and this opera house, you may have heard, you may know already that um, there are beehives on this opera house and we can actually see them in these images. But before we do, I forgot, I wanted to show you this. I wanted to zoom in here. Look at this. Oh my goodness, look at the colors. In the back of the main there, I love how this this oxidized bronze or copper is just stunning. With a little bit of the Eiffel Tower peeking out. So anyway, yeah, back to the beehives. I'm, I'm, I can show you those. Those are visible here on the roof. We're making our way toward the front of the building. <clears throat> Let me go this way. Again, you can see these staircases, these narrow little staircases that are very um, strategically placed. And then look at this, we're actually allowed, of course we can't always walk everywhere we want on these virtual reality, reality platforms, but here you're allowed to walk through this, down this little trough. Ah, and look what we got here. These are some of the beehives. So if you've heard about the beehives, but always wondered where they're located, they're right here, pretty much above where the auditorium sits. Uh, of course, there's a story here. There's always a story, right? That's why we're here. There was a retired prop man for the opera who um, was training as a bee harvester or beekeeper at the Luxembourg Gardens. You may know that they have still today for over 150 years. They've been training people. It's called, are they called apiaries and apiary? Um, I hope so. I hope that's right. Um, where they train, train you to harvest or keep bees. That still exists in the Luxembourg Gardens. So he was training there and he ordered his very first beehive and he was very excited and it came all sealed up, you know, so the bees couldn't get out. And he, his idea was that he was going to install it in his country home outside of Paris. So he decided to deliver, get the beehive delivered to the opera house where, where he was retired from and still had connections. But then there was a problem. There was a, a problem with his plans at the country home to install the beehive. So he realized that he couldn't take it there. He had to keep it at the opera house. And he panicked because those sealed beehives don't actually last too long. I think at, in the, after like 48 hours or so, if they're sealed up too long, the bees will start to die. So he panicked a little bit and without permission, he schlepped his way up to the Paris, uh, the, the opera house, to the rooftop rather, and opened, unsealed the beehive and kept it there to um, keep his bees from dying. He came back a couple weeks later and to his amazement, the, it was all filled with honey and the honey was spectacular. It was enormous, incredibly flavorful and sweet and flowery. And uh, what had happened was the bees just went to town. You could uh, think of Paris, think of all the parks, the chest chestnut trees, the linden trees, all of the, the flowers in the balcony, all of the flowers in the cemeteries, let alone uh, the parks and the balconies. And um, just on and on and the bees went and they created this amazing uh, honey. And so he eventually got permission to install uh, legally his beehive and others as well. And today there are uh, up to 10 beehives, a few on this side, a few on the other side. And uh, every now and then the people um, behind this, they go up and they harvest the honey. You can buy this honey. It's called Opera Honey or Le, Le Miel de l'Opera. You can buy it in, depending on the season and the time of year, you can buy this honey in the gift shops of this opera and the Opera Bastille. And then last I checked, you can also buy it in the Fauchon uh, Gourmet Foods stores in Paris. Fauchon. So yeah, can you imagine that? You can still get a hold of this beautiful, beautiful opera honey. And um, these, this is not the only roof with beehives. There are apparently up to 150 total beehives throughout Paris on the rooftops of buildings like the Galerie Lafayette, Notre Dame Cathedral, the Grand Palais, the uh, restaurant Tour d'Argent, uh, on top of all these places. In fact, at La Tour d'Argent, which you may know is a, a very, very expensive gourmet restaurant, you can have afternoon tea in that restaurant with their own house honey that they harvest from the rooftop of the building. Let's 
La -da 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 -da. Look at these details. Actually, I can show you a little bit closer. So let's make our way to up these little stairs. Amy Harden says, I want some of that honey. Christina says, in freak incredible. This is, do you remember when I mentioned they used to um, pull the chandelier up through the ceiling? And then when they didn't need to anymore, they could use this building for something else. And now it is rehearsal rooms. You can actually use this Google platform to go in there and take a look. It's not super fancy, but from the inside, you can see the silhouette of these liars in the windows. But anyway, that's what's happening literally above the auditorium itself and the chandelier and the Chagall uh, ceiling and all that. And then look at these beauties. Sorry, I had to check something on my window. All right. A couple more things that I want to point out here while we're on the roof. And what I need to do is, yeah, sorry, I didn't need to swing you around that much, but, oh, by the way, we'll zoom in here. Can you make out those other beehives just right there in brown? So that's where they're located. I uh, don't want to do that. I want to do that. Take me down here. Do the old uh, double click trick. Okay, here we go. Walking along this rather precarious ledge. Kudos again to the, uh, the photographer who got us these images. Um, these beautiful gilded allegories are harmony and poetry. This one is the backside of poetry and then harmony is over there. Again, a reminder that no, no statue is really uh, random in Europe. Uh, there's always a meaning. It's always got a name. It's always representing something. Uh, okay, so we're going to finish here with perhaps, like, can we get centered a little bit more? Come on, Corey, do your job, bro. Do your job. No, I can't go any further? Yeah, we can. Okay. Ah, that's more pleasing, isn't it? A couple of things I want to mention here from the rooftop, and then we'll uh, wrap up this. Holy cow, this episode is going to be like a record. It's like an hour and 15 minutes. My goodness, I got to hurry up here. Um, oh, I don't know why my screen refreshed. I think even my computer's tired, so let's wrap this up. Um, this right here is the Place de l'Opéra. And anecdotal, incidentally, it happened to be one of the very first places that received uh, electric lighting, some of the very primitive versions of electric lamps in Paris here, because of course that's where the money was. And then some of you heard this story, but it really bears worth, uh, it's really worth repeating uh, because it's really fun. In French, you don't say, um, break a leg to a performer before they go on stage. Instead, you would say merde, which is the French word for S-H-I-T. And so you would wish someone lots of merde before they go on stage to wish them luck. And that originates from the fact that when you had a very successful show, in particular here in front of the opera in the 19th century, excuse me, you would have a lot of horse-drawn carriages bringing up the audience members because they were flooding in because of the, the successful um, uh, show. And so you would have a lot of horse poop. You would have a lot of merde. And so that's why still today you wish in French someone uh, merde to wish them good luck uh, as a performance because a theater that has a lot of poop outside of it would of course be a very successful theater and the per performers themselves would be successful as a result. Now another little quirk of this is I, I heard that if you are the performer and someone says merde to you, you can't say merci. You cannot say thank you because that will actually jinx the good luck. You, in fact, your proper response is supposed to be oui. Yes. So someone says merde and you say oui. And then you go on stage and you're good. So that's the story behind that. Yesenia saying, I remember that fact, lol. Cindy Grief is laughing about it. Sharon, Sharon Peterson says that's hilarious. Um, but then also I want to talk to you about, so that's the Place de l'Opéra, but here's the Avenue de l'Opéra. And right at the very end here, we've got the Louvre. All those rooftops of the Louvre. That happened to be where Napoleon himself, the emperor, whose really idea this whole thing was, uh, he was residing there. You can still visit the Napoleon apartments and uh, they're sumptuous and gorgeous and actually kind of a similar style um, to as the opera house itself. So anyway, he was living there, down there in the Louvre, and he this didn't exist when the, the opera house was being built. It didn't exist at all. And in fact, um, when I showed you uh, the, the image of the, the boulevard being built, the black and white image at the start of this episode, this is what they were doing. 
And Napoleon, of course, his idea was, he told Osman, who was designing all of this, he said, I want to um, have a, a straight view visually from my apartments to my fancy opera house. So that's why this was bulldozed through and opened up. But also when it's time for me to go to the opera and I'm gonna leave my apartments here, I just wanna have a nice straight shot. Okay, get me there as quick as possible. And I want a view of the building as well. So that's what Osman did, he opened up this boulevard. What happened at the time though is Osman and um, Garnier never really got along. They didn't see eye to eye. They were really cut from two different cloths, so to speak. For example, when uh, Osman was building his buildings around here, around the same time as the Opera House, he was dismayed that the Opera House was gonna be so damn tall and it was actually going to outshine his beautiful uh, Housemanian buildings. So Houseman actually um, broke his own rule because he had very strict rules about how high his buildings could be and how wide and the proportions. So here, specifically in this part of the arrondissement, Osman broke his own rule and added an extra floor and made these buildings even taller than he was supposed to. Um, to compete with the Opera House. And the funny thing is, apparently Garnier, when he saw that was happening, um, responded by building the Opera House a little bit higher, a little bit taller. So these buildings were actually competing, the two architects competing with each other for, you know, what would take center stage and what would get predominance visually in the square. So with that all in mind, know that Osman built this and put trees all along, these beautiful trees. We can assume they were probably chestnuts and or uh, lime trees or linden trees. And Garnier hated that because you can imagine if you were down here on the avenue, on the boulevard, looking back at the opera house, it would be obscured partly by these big trees in the summertime. So Garnier always secretly hated Haussmann for that. And in fact, what happened was when Napoleon fell from power and Haussmann was long gone, what Garnier did is he very promptly tried to convince the city to cut down the trees on the boulevard. And he convinced them to do so. So Garnier is actually responsible for mowing down all of the trees along this avenue so that he, his opera could, of course, have top billing and a, a beautiful uh, perspective all the way down. So there you go. Thank you, Ricky Beltran. He says, may I freaking see great stories. I appreciate that, folks. You know, um, as you know, my philosophy is these buildings are beautiful just to look at aesthetically, without a doubt. But once you can dig a little bit deeper and know the, the anecdotes and the stories and the reasoning behind them, of course, uh, it gets even more fascinating so why don't we that's too much why don't we get the proper zoom sorry i don't know why my mouse does this this is my mouse doing this let me pinch oh no that was terrible that's not what i wanted um there we go sorry got a little distracted there uh, here we go. Okay, we're gonna finish there. Thanks everybody. I mean, it's like an hour and 20 minutes. This is ridiculous. Thank you so much for all of you live viewers that stuck stuck uh, with me through thick and thin and I hope you appreciated this. And you know, bravo to all of you watching the replay that stuck around for an hour and 20 minutes. So I think that's it folks. I'll catch you on the next episode. We'll move on to another building or maybe we'll be on the streets of Paris um, ourselves. We'll see what the, what the future brings. But thank you so much for watching this two-parter. Again, everything you need in the description for Patreon links or my merchandise that, you, that I'm selling or my um, PayPal or just links to all sorts of things, Instagram, Facebook, you can, you can find all that in the description and you can find a link to part one if you didn't catch that. So thanks everybody. Um, Tina Landis, thank you for the, the super chat there. I really appreciate it. What we'll do is um, we've got a little bit of time. We'll pop over to our private cafe chats group on Facebook and I'll say hello to you. We'll have a little cafe chat privately. Give me five or 10 minutes to, to head over there if you are a current Patreon member. Thanks everybody, hope you enjoyed this deep dive um, into the Paris Opera House and I will catch you on the next episode. See you later. End stream. <laughs>